And uh, I lead a team right now, and we're trying to solve a pretty hard problem. We want to prepare students to be the scientists and technologists of the future. And we're starting in the primary schools, starting from the first grade. And it's a pretty hard problem, because how do we teach the science of the future when we don't know what that science will be? How it used to work is, if we teach them all the science that we know right now, and we hope, right, some of it, a little of it, might still be relevant when they have a chance to put it to work. But it doesn't work very well. I mean, if only we can teach them all the science we know right now, and then send them back a couple hundred years, and wouldn't that be fantastic? Right? They would know everything. They would know all the cutting edge. They would be able to come up with all kinds of invention because they would know way more than everyone around them. But we can't really do that. Right? Instead, of sending, instead of teaching kids a lot of science and sending them into the past, we will actually have to send them into the future. 10 years, 15 years into the future. Everything they learn now, we hope they will be able to use when they graduate from college, when they enter the workforce. And so if we think about science as just a lot of facts, then we have a huge worry. What kind of science is not going is, is to be obsolete by the time they try to use it? Right? What will the future look like? 15 years from now. I mean, to get a feel for that, let's think about what was the coolest thing, the highest tech, 15 years ago. You remember this? All right, did anyone <laughs> remember the first time they got their Blackberry and how cool that was? But it's not so cool anymore, right? Science is changing so fast, and technology is changing so fast, and it's actually changing faster and faster every day, there's no way we can tell what's going to be the hottest thing, the most relevant thing, when our students need to start applying what they learn. Right? We know what's cool today. We know AI is cool today. We know autonomous vehicles are cool today. We know genetics are cool today. But what's going to be cool in 15 years? And if we can't tell what's going to be cool, if we can't predict what's going to be cool, the hottest thing in 15 years from now. How do we go about preparing the scientists and technologists of the future? So, we turn the problem around. Maybe it's not as important to teach them a lot of things, a lot of facts that might become obsolete. Why don't we teach them to be scientists? And we do know how scientists work, right? Scientists start with a question, and then they try to do a lot of research, and they try to come up with discoveries. We know scientists work in large teams, right? Sometimes across the whole country, sometimes collaborating with labs across the world, right? And we also know that scientists are not afraid to fail. When they come up with an idea, they plan an experiment, and they go do it, they don't expect it to work the first time. Not in real life, not real science. Right? And this, this is pretty obvious. We have to ask ourselves, this is not how our students are learning right now. Right? They don't start with the question. We start by doing a lot of lectures and explaining and explaining and explaining whether or not they have a question. We want to keep explaining. Right? And they don't work as teams. Right? If they don't understand something, and they look at the person next to them and ask them, we call that cheating. And in terms of failure, that's even worse. If a student gets something wrong, we put a big red mark on it. Right? And they learn to fear that. They learn to fear that, oh, if you get it, if you don't get it right the first time, it's bad. What if we turn that all around? How would we 
give, chance, give kids a chance to learn science the way scientists do science. And you do start with a question. And it comes as a shock to students who, are, who, who first get to our labs, right? We ask them a hard question, and they say, teacher, you can't ask that. You haven't given us the answer yet. How can you ask that? And then we're like, we know. We, don't, we know you don't know the answer. We, don't, we know you don't know the science. But think about it. What do you think? Why do you think it's that way? What do you think will happen? And then they get to thinking. And if they, if they think really hard and they can't figure it out, we might tell them just a little, just a little to get them going further. And then we want them to think some more. So it's important to start with a question. Start with good, hard questions. And then keep asking even more questions, more and more questions. It's much less important to explain than to get them to think, get them to figure it out. And what does it look like when a student is actually learning? This is a student frowning, but it's actually a happy frown. Because when students just listen to teachers lecturing, they actually have a completely blank look on their face. Some of you might remember that from the people next to you in the classroom. It's completely blank. You're just trying to absorb and memorizing and memorizing, but when you actually have to think, you wear a little frown and you're struggling, and that's what real learning looks like. Taking challenges, tackling challenges as a team. This, it's not just about working together or doing something together. The most important part of students learning as a team is learning how to think together, right? When we want our students to share what they think, we don't want them to share it with the teacher. In a traditional classroom, the teacher will ask questions, right? People raise their hands and, you know, share with the class what they think. Or, or else the teacher would just tell you what to think. But that's, you need to flip that around, right? Don't just share with the teacher, actually share with each other. And if you find that something is hard to explain in words, draw it out, make a diagram. I don't think you can see that in this picture, but at our labs, all the tables are actually whiteboard surfaces. And the students are drawing and drawing and arguing with each other about the science and that's how they figure things out. Instead of saying, hey, is it right? Is that what the book said? And lastly, working as a team, we expect our students to try to convince and be convinced. And I want to take a moment to explain what that means. Because in traditional learning, there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Right? And it's very clear what the right answer is. The right answer is whatever the teacher tells you it is. Right? It's whatever is in the book. When we do the problem, it's whatever is in the back of the book. But that's, that's not real learning. We expect our students to actually challenge each other. And it's not good enough to say, I think that's, the, that's how the science works, and that's just the way it is. I think that's the way it is. That's not enough. We want them to be able to defend their thinking, provide the reasoning. I think it's that way because this, that, and the other. I, and that's very important to allow them a chance to build deep understanding. And convince and be convinced. Because as they work in a group, sometimes you think you understand what's going on, you want to convince your team members, but you also have to listen. You have to try to figure out what they're trying to tell you. And that's what effective learning and effective learning in a team looks like. You have to listen. Is what they're saying making sense? And lastly, it's OK to fail. When you're learning, when you're doing something new, as all scientists do, right? it's OK to fail. So at our labs, we don't give our students simple little things to do that everyone's going to get right the first time. We actually give them really hard problems, real science, really tricky stuff, 
Stuff maybe they might not even see in high school. And we don't worry that they don't know it. We don't worry that they'll fail. We actually expect them to fail, right? There's a lot of reasons they'll fail, right? If they don't understand it yet, that's the whole point, right? If they don't know how to do something, that's the point. You have a chance to find out, a chance to figure it out, right? And with working with tools and working with new materials, if you don't know, if you don't have the skills yet, then you have a chance to learn it, figuring out, learn it together, right? It's not about just reading about what someone else discovered hundreds of years ago. Science is about figuring things out. So we have a topic, uh, one of our many topics. We challenge our students to design and build a small airplane, but an airplane that can fly away, fly out of the line of sight, either so high or so far that you can't see it anymore. And they have to do this from scratch. We don't give them a kit that they just assemble together with the instructions and then fly it. I mean, that's a toy. That's not learning. They start with nothing, and they have to figure out why, why, why something would fly. And they can ask for materials, and we give them all raw materials, basic materials, no preformed, pre-cut materials. They have to figure it out. You want something? How much of it do you want? What kind do you want? How big? If you want it in a different shape, form it yourselves. Right? If the student asks us, hey, can you give us a propeller? We say, hmm, why do you want a propeller? Well, because airplanes have propellers. We're like, OK. So we give them a propeller. But sometimes we give them a boat propeller. And they run off, and they're happy. And they'll find out it doesn't work. But along the way, they'll find out, hey, what is a propeller? Why do airplanes need propeller, and what's the use? And that's real learning. Because if you just assemble something that someone else has already picked apart for you, or, or designed for you, every piece just has to fit together, and it's guaranteed to work, there's no exploration. And over the course of eight weeks of continually trying, building a plane, figuring out how it works, flying it, bam, hits the ground. Pick it up, figure out why it didn't work, try again, make some changes, fly, bam, hit the ground again. Failure after failure after failure. And our students learn that it's okay. You don't, when you're trying to do something new and something challenging, you're not expected to succeed the first time or the tenth time. The most important thing is you keep trying and you learn every, every step, right? If, when something doesn't work, it's not a setback. It's actually a step forward. So does this type of learning work? Is it creating the scientists and technologists of the future? Well, we don't have a time machine, so we can't really tell. We hope so. Because our students, they learn some very critical things that are not going to become obsolete. I don't care how the technology changes, how the science changes, but these things are fundamental. It's OK not to know. As a matter of fact, it's great when we know that we don't, we don't know something, because that's the first step to learning, first step to figuring, out, figuring it out. Second, imagine if learning something means you have to be convinced that you don't just believe it because it's in a book or because some expert said so, but you actually have to be convinced. You have to, it has to make sense to you. We completely change how our students feel about learning, understand what it means to really get something versus if they, if they think the answer matches the book. Right? And working together, 
not just doing things as a team, but thinking as a team and being able to do more than you can do by yourself and make, making the best use of each person on your team. Those are skills and those are abilities that are going to apply no matter how the future changes. And the most important thing, of course, is to never, ever give up. Right? You put your heart into something, it's something challenging, especially if it's challenging, and you never give up, you will never fail. And we believe that if we're able to provide this kind of learning for our students, this is how we will have the leading scientists and technologists of the future. Thank you. <laughs>